Big mistrust of big tech. The US Congress questions the heads of Apple, Amazon, Google and Facebook on anti-competitive behavior. Have the internet giants become too powerful? And is there a need for new laws to regulate them? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. Amazon, Apple, Google and Facebook. Four companies that have changed the way we live, work, shop and stay in touch with our friends and family. But the American tech giants have long been accused of abusing their power to drive out competition and mishandling user data. The US Congress has been investigating their business practices for years. On Wednesday, politicians questioned the firm's chief executives as they considered changes to antitrust laws. We'll bring in our guests in a moment. But first, this report from Alan Fisher in Washington, D.C. Fittingly, the tech giants appeared virtually to face questions, the subcommittee chairman making clear he sees a problem. Their dominance is killing the small businesses, manufacturing and overall dynamism that are the engines of the American economy. Their ability to dictate terms, call the shots, upend entire sectors and inspire fear represent the powers of a private government. This was meant to be an inquiry into business practices. Do the four companies, Google, Amazon, Apple and Facebook, stifle rivals and kill competition? One Republican immediately made clear he also wanted to talk about bias online. We love the fact that these are American companies, but what's not great is censoring people, censoring conservatives and trying to impact elections. And if it doesn't end, there has to be consequences. From each of the four bosses, a common theme. They were innovators, job creators, the definition of American excellence. There's room in retail for multiple winners. We compete against large established players like Target, Costco, Kroger, and of course, Walmart, a company more than twice Amazon's size. Our goal is the best, not the most. In fact, we don't have a dominant share in any market or in any product category where we do business. Facebook boss Mark Zuckerberg faced questions about the purchase of another social media platform, Instagram. This, said one congressman, went to the heart of the inquiry. Facebook saw Instagram as a threat that could potentially siphon business away from Facebook. And so rather than compete with it, Facebook bought it. This is exactly the type of anti-competitive acquisition that the antitrust laws were designed to prevent. Mark Zuckerberg was asked about hate speech appearing on his site. He insisted he was committed to intercepting it before most users saw it. He said that the success rate was currently running at 89%, but he wanted to get that up to 99%. Zuckerberg also talked about the recent removal of misleading content around COVID-19 and treatments. Dangerous, he said. We do prohibit content that will lead to imminent risk of harm. And stating that... Uh, there's a proven cure for COVID when there is in fact none, um, might encourage someone to go take something that could have some adverse effects. So we do take that down. The subcommittee says it will hold new hearings in September. This is not the end for the tech giants, it's the start. And it puts them on notice. If they don't look at their operations, legislators will. Alan Fisher, Al Jazeera, Capitol Hill. Let's bring in our panel. In Washington, D.C., we have Larry Irving, a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communications and Information and a former vice president of the tech company Hewlett-Packard. In New Delhi, we have Itika Sharma Punit, editor of Quartz India, who specializes in India's tech industry. And in Belgium, we have Mark Kokelberg, a professor at the University of Vienna and a member of the European Commission's expert group on artificial intelligence. A welcome to you all. I'd like to begin in Washington, D.C. with Larry Irving. This is a $4.85 trillion industry. It has billions of users. It is invasive, and I'm using that word deliberately, in almost every aspect of our lives. Is Congress asking the wrong question? This isn't about antitrust laws anymore or about competition or about... We should be treating this as a global situation where big tech needs policing. Is that right? Yes and no. Um, if you looked at yesterday's um, hearing, there were two-thirds of the questions of antitrust, and it's the antitrust committee. 
But there are another one third of the questions were about the larger issues of what big tech is doing and how it's doing it. So I'd say that we, we're looking domestically at all of the implications of what's happening with big tech, uh, what's happening with particularly these four companies. But the antitrust implications are huge because if you don't have competition, you're going to depress innovation and you also have uh, significant impacts on, on consumers. So I think from the antitrust committee's standpoint, getting that competition, getting that innovation going is critical. Consumers care about competition. Consumers care about innovation. But there are other questions, and there are other parts of the U.S. government and other parts of the, uh, the public discourse that are focusing on those issues as well. But, but Larry, is, is competition the absolute answer to all of this? I mean, let's take a look at the, the telecommunications sector. There is competition there, but there are still monopolies. There are still huge companies controlling everything. You know, our, the United States has a uniquely interesting um, um, antitrust uh, environment. So competition is a, is, a, is a key component. We look at competition as being an, an important part of anything we do in terms of our policy. Uh, when you look at what's happening in the European Union, what's happening in India and Asia, they have different antitrust regimes. We kind of start, in, from our business uh, standpoint, and look at the competition models. But that's not the only value here. No, we do care about election interference. We do care about hate speech. We do care um, a, a, about those other kind of core fundamental values that people are talking about. But if you have a situation where a company is buying a company for the purpose of putting them out of business or threatening to put them out of business unless they can be bought, that's a competition problem. If you have a company that sells products and then steals the best products uh, being sold on, online and, and creates their own product uh, at a lower price, that's a competition problem. So we've got to try to balance all of these things. Again, these companies are U.S. companies. They were created here. They were economic marvels. They are technological marvels. Billions of people around the planet use them. So on the one hand, we want to continue the benefits that these companies give to people. On the other hand, we want to make sure that we're not distorting the marketplace, that people aren't being harmed, that innovation isn't being harmed. And that's a delicate balance. It's not something that is going to come easy. Um, and Congress is probably, our Congress, the United States, is particularly not well armed to take on these issues because they don't have the kind of quick answers that I think most people on the planet are hoping for if they think there's a problem. Let's bring in Mark Kokelberg in Belgium. Is the U.S. Congress asking the right questions of Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc.? Well, I think, of course, this is about competition, um, but, it, but it's also about the enormous power that the big tech companies have gained um, during the last decades. Um, it's about a technology that's no longer, I think, just a technology, but that's that's there um, in the middle of our lives. And I'm not surprised that big political um, tensions are now already and are much more going to be um, ab about digital tech. In New Delhi, Itika Sharma Punit, uh, we mentioned earlier, one of our guests mentioned India specifically earlier. It has a different antitrust regime, a different set of antitrust laws. What's India's biggest concern, particularly as one of the biggest developing markets when it comes for, to tech? Um, so we do have our own antitrust policies, but some of the allegations that have been raised in the U.S. Uh, are very alarming. Uh, uh, for instance, you know, the whole... A piece about using data about third-party sellers from the platform uh, uh, to kill small business businesses, an allegation against Amazon. Uh, in the India context, e-commerce is still very new to India, and Amazon is at the forefront of building it out in the country. So if Amazon has actually managed to navigate American laws and uh, uh, be biased against third-party sellers uh, or has been instrumental in killing small businesses, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it has navigated Indian laws to do that in India also, uh, given the fact that most small sellers in India don't have a very rich experience of working with online retailers in the past. This is all very new to them. It has happened in the last decade or less. Uh, Amazon is literally building out the market in India in that sense. So if these allegations are correct, uh, it just highlights how 
scary the situation in India would be. But the, for India particularly, there's also the security situation as well when it comes to big tech. Let's take the case of BlackBerry uh, a few years ago where they wanted to, the Indian government wanted access to BlackBerry servers, BlackBerry said no, and BlackBerry dis almost disappeared in the country as a result. Where do you, where, do, where does the Indians figure their security versus freedom comes into this, comes into play? Uh, so this has been an ongoing debate in India for several years, uh, like the BlackBerry example you mentioned. More recently, there has been discussions between India and Facebook. Uh, India recently banned a host of Chinese apps because of data privacy issues. So it's, it's an ongoing debate. The main demand of the Narendra Modi government has been that these companies host their data centers in India. Uh, there are a lot of challenges to that, uh, including the fact that India does not have the infrastructure to support the kind of servers that Facebook, say, or the Twitter or, or an Amazon would need. Uh, the policy is still being discussed and some nuances are still being work, worked out. So uh, in that sense, vis-a-vis -vis data privacy, it is a, a serious uh, concern for the Indian government. Uh, even when it comes to e-commerce, the Indian government has been taking steps to ensure better privacy for Indian users. Larry Irving in Washington, D.C. Security, obviously a very key concern for the U.S. government as well and for governments all over the world. Because there are so many people involved in big tech, either as consumers or people working in that industry, surely it's time to stop treating them like businesses are more like nation states. I mean, one of the congressmen did say that these are almost have the power of small governments. Maybe it is time to look at it that way. It, I don't think we've ever been in the situation that we're in today. Um, traditionally, the biggest companies in the United States had huge market power in the United States and some market power globally. Um, I think last I heard, Facebook has 2.6 billion users. Um, Apple is, uh, is one of the most important technologies comes anywhere in the planet. The iPhone is ubiquitous. When you look at what's happening with Google and you look at what's happening with any of these companies, they're different than any companies ever been before. That I'll grant you. But, but the problem is, how do you regulate a, a global company that people want to use, where people see huge benefit and say, we're going to stop them providing the benefits to the consumer? That's the balance that I think these, uh, that Congress is trying to deal with, uh, and I trust authorities trying to deal with, that the European Union's um, authorities trying to use it. On the one hand, we do see potential abuses. And again, until you have a court case, I'm a lawyer, until these allegations are proven, they're allegations. So you've got to go through a process, which is a long process, with well-heeled companies. One other thing I want to add. Historically, whether you've looked at AT&T or you've looked at Microsoft, you've looked at General Motors, the United States has had these big global striding companies that people said were dominant in, um, companies, IBM. Over time, newer, smarter, more innovative companies come along and, and undercut those companies or replace those companies. So are we, I when I started in the government at the US Department of Commerce, the concern around the planet was Microsoft and how much power they had. When I started in telecommunications policy, the concern was AT&T and how much power they had. Now, courts did involve themselves and did change the structure of those companies over time, I think you're going to see the same thing with regard to the big four today. But I also think you're going to see innovative entrepreneurs who just aren't willing to settle for the status quo. And that's the combination we need. Focus government and companies that come in and say, I can do this better than you do it, and I'm going to prove it in the marketplace. Uh, I am going to come to our guests in New Delhi in Belgium, but I'd like to follow up a quick point with you, Larry. IBM, AT&T, all the companies that you mentioned, even the one you used to work for, Hewlett Packard, actually sold mm -hmm. us something. We are now the product. That's the difference. And that's scary. That's something that not co Congress doesn't understand. Now, it is time, surely, to police that, because we're the product. I think you're going to see policing. And, and you know, yesterday was the first salvo. Uh, Congress started acting. We're in the middle of our election season. I'm a Democrat, which you know, may or may not be important but in the rest of the world. But in our, in our political system, Democrats generally have had a more focused approach on competition, have been much more concerned about antitrust enforcement than Republicans who are much more market-oriented. I do believe that in a Biden presidency, you're going to see a lot more scrutiny. Um, I don't know how this is going to end up, and nobody else does either, because the, the reality is antitrust litigation takes a long time. It is a slow process, and these very rich companies 
have a lot of ability to protect themselves against um, antitrust enforcement. That's the reality. So it's going to be political persuasion and it's going to be antitrust enforcement. And I think those two forces are going to be what's going to be required to really make some significant differences. It's not that people in the United States are unaware. It's not that regulators are unaware. It's what's the right solution that benefits consumers and competition? Because to your point, we may be the product, but there are billions of people who are enjoying this product and benefiting from this product. And particularly during the pandemic, I get an Amazon product every day delivered at my door. Maybe there'd be an alternative, but I do know that right now, if I walk up and down my block in Washington, D.C., every other house is getting something from Amazon. People aren't going to give that up easily. Uh, it's a Kashama Punit in, in New Delhi. We have a whole raft of international arms treaty treaties. There are many of them. Countries sign up to them. Is it time for an international digital treaty? Uh, most definitely. And I would just like to bring in here the gentleman before me was talking about innovation and how certain entrepreneurs would go ahead and break this monopoly. But at the same time, uh, uh, for I mean, I, I would want to cite an in India example here. We have a really massive, booming young startup uh, ecosystem. We are the world's second or third largest startup ecosystem. But Google and Facebook have both made, made acquisitions in India, and they continue to be uh, very uh, involved with the community. So, uh, for a young entrepreneur with those dreams to 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 you know sort of build a business that breaks that monopoly, uh, can get really intimidating and hard. For instance, in the e-commerce sector itself, we have a whole host of locally uh, created e-commerce portals focusing on niche, focusing on marketplaces, etc. But Amazon continues to be the leader because nobody can match that the kind of money and muscle and marketing that that an Amazon can bring. Uh, as far as the global digitization treaty goes, I, I, I believe that is something to be looked at because uh, internet companies are not geography uh, agnostic. They are not limited. Internet is not limited to a certain region. Uh, and in most cases, unless a government or a, or, or a, or a ruling party has a has a mandate on not letting the people access something or has created a wall garden, everyone can access everything on the internet. So in that context, all, all governments, uh, all leaders should come together and sort of create a, an internet economy that is more conducive and nurturing of businesses and positive as a whole. Mark Kokelberg, uh, Kokelberg in Belgium, um, is there something to be learned from the Chinese here? The Chinese have their own, almost own separate ecosystem from the rest of the world. There's not a huge amount of Facebook. There's not a huge amount of Twitter. They've got their own versions of that domestically. Uh, they've managed to control the flow of information. Is there something to be learned from that? Well, what, what can be learned from it is that politics doesn't need to be totally powerless um, in, in, in the face of these, these companies. Um, but I think it's not a good solution to um, to, to close borders there. Um, I, I think it's it's a better way to, um, as we just discussed, to to try to govern this globally. Uh, the problems we we see here with digital technologies in general, it's not only about these um, uh, particular companies. I think the problems we see are, are global, and so um, it, I think it would would benefit everyone, uh, all citizens over the world, if we had um, more regulation at the global level. Um, but of course, so far this is not not happening, not happening enough, and we have very different um, different political cultures um, and and for example um, in in Europe there's there's a lot of emphasis on regulation uh, whereas in the US that that is still a, a difficult um, a difficult issue in this sector well let's talk about uh, let's talk about Europe a little bit more mark I'm very interested where does the European Union stand on things like antitrust laws as they apply in America where does the European Union see big tech well, as, as we've seen in the past years that um, European Union has taken action um, against some behaviors of these big tech companies um, and sort of pushed back on, on um, the fact that they make the rules and, and um, everyone in, on the planet, including people in Europe, have to, have to follow. So um, I think what, what Europe has shown in the, the past years is that it's... Um, 
it, it has shown leadership in terms of regulation. It has shown that um, regulation is possible um, and, and can be very effective, like the GDPR, the, the Privacy and Data Protection Regulation in Europe, um, has effectively worked for European citizens to protect their, their rights um, against these companies. Um, so I think that's that's a very positive thing that that um, it shows that it's possible to to do something, um, and it doesn't have to mean that um, that competition and innovation is strangled. I think um, it's possible to find a, a balance there. Larry Irving, both our guests, both our guests in uh, Belgium and New Delhi, have suggested that actually international oversight will happen at some point. The Congress uh, report. Go on, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. International oversight is happening, and 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 I think what's important to note is that folks in the United States are, are noticing what's happening in India and the concerns in India, and we want a vibrant uh, entrepreneurial class in India. Um, I know that I've been informed a great deal by what's happening in the European Union. The European Commission has their privacy policies, their competition policies have helped inform how we think about what needs to be done here in the United States. We have a different structure. It, uh, these are kind of local champions, um, and our, comp our antitrust laws are much more difficult and much, it, it takes a longer time for them to go through. It's not that we're unaware, and I, and I think that my colleague from Europe got it exactly right. We have a balancing act that we have to focus on. It's not just about competition, it's not just about consumers, it's not just about regulations. And that's what we're trying to, we're trying to hit that sweet spot no one here is unaware of the problem. You can't pick up a newspaper in the United States, you can't turn on a television without worrying about the effect on elections, hate speech, privacy, data security, children, competition. All of those issues are on the table. What's the best way to address them is the issue. The harder part is finding a way to, inter, uh, to harmonize these internationally, because there are different regimes. And I don't think, it, you know, we're seeing what's beginning called a splinter net, where China will have one regulatory uh, policy, Europe will have a different regulatory policy, the United States will have a, a, a third regulatory policy. I can assure you that no one in the United States wants the, Chin wants the Chinese uh, authority, where the government is embedded in so much of what the companies do. So there's the balance there. I mean, on the one hand, we actively reject kind of a Chinese model. Some of us look at what Europe's doing and think that's important. And some of us realize that there are some uh, infirmities, I guess is the best word, of the U.S. model. But how do we get to a place where all of us globally are having these conversations and working in the best interest of consumers, because I think that's where we're really where we are. Well, it's a very interesting word you use, the splinter net. I mean, you have a president in the U.S. right now who isn't a huge fan of international treaties, has pulled out of several of them, trying to persuade him to go for a digital treaty may not be the best solution, particularly as he's coming up to an election in November. So the splinter net might be the de facto solution. Surely, it might just be the thing that we can all agree on. Well, and, and we may not agree on it, but it may be what's happening. I mean, I do think that you are seeing very different regulatory models. I was on a call with the Undersecretary of, of uh, Undersecretary General of the United Nations and a bunch of global thinkers over the last week. I've been on two calls with them, and there are all of us globally who care about competition and innovation who got in this game because we want to see a vibrant, robust um, technology sector have some concerns about what's happening, but we also don't want to overreact because, you know, the, you know, the unintended consequences when you're talking about, to your point, uh, companies with a market cap of $5 billion that um, employ hundreds of thousands of people and who serve billions of people are also something we have to take into account. I don't know that people want us to uh, take Facebook down. We want to, Facebook to behave better um, with its, in, 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 the, in the sandbox. I don't think people want to see Google go away. It serves an important purpose. We want to make sure that Google isn't using its market power to distort the marketplace or to harm other competitors. Those are the kinds of issues. How do you keep the services for people while at the same, and, and at a price point that most people can afford, which is free, um, even though they're the product, it's still they like the fact that this isn't costing them money out of their pockets, while at the same time making sure that we're not harming those consumers, that their privacy is being protected, that new cons uh, competitors can come on board, and that if I'm a guy with a product I don't put that product on a marketplace and then have a big guy come in and say, I'm going to undercut you, lose money for a while until I put you out of business. That's what no one wants to see. I want to thank all our guests, Larry Irving, Itika Sharma Punit and Mark Kukelberg. And thank you too for watching the program again. And you can see it by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And as ever...
social media is very important. Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now. <laughs>